Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA a certification training course on network troubleshooting tools. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to go through the requirements from the practical application exam, which is 227.02, section 3.1. The troubleshooting tools, and most of them that are here, are command line tools that you'll use whenever you're trying to find problems that might be occurring on the network. We're going to step through each one of these. And by the end of this module, you'll know exactly the scenario you should use whenever you should take advantage of these. And you'll also be able to run these at a command line yourself. Let's start with one of the tools that you'll probably end up using the most whenever you start troubleshooting, and that's the ping command. Ping is something that's used to send a request to another device. And if that device is active, it will send a response back to that, very much like a submarine sending a ping out via sonar and getting a response back from whatever happens to be around it. It's behind the scenes really using a protocol called ICMP. And it's using a function of that protocol called an echo request. And what you're hoping to get back is an echo reply. This is a management protocol that's built into TCP IP. It's something that also you can't always rely on. Not every device is pingable. Not every device will respond to a ping, even if it is active. So most of the time, what we're trying to do is ping a device that normally we would absolutely expect a response back from that device. Let's try pinging a few things around our network and see what the response is. Here's my Windows Vista workstation. Let's start pinging around at some devices on my network. I happen to know. On my network, 192.168.0.1 is my router. And if my router is there, I should get a response back. So it even says it's pinging 192.168.0.1. And it's pinging it with 32 bytes of data. So it sends those 32 bytes out. And what we should expect is a response with those 32 bytes. And indeed, we do. We get a reply with 32 bytes. It took only 2 milliseconds and a time to live number of 64. That's a number that's used by TCP IP. Whenever uh, these IP frames are going out and they go through a router, that number will decrease by 1. And it's a useful utility. It's a useful function of IP because if there happens to be a loop in the network, the time to live will rapidly decrease all the way down to 0. And the next router that gets it says, sorry, your time to live is 0, and it drops it. So looking at this, we know that we could step through at least 64 different hops or, or routers until that it tries to drop this particular frame. Let's see what type of response we get if we ping something out over the internet. I'm going to ping 8.8.8.8. .8 that is a Google DNS service that they have. And it's a great one to use for troubleshooting internet connectivity because 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 should always be there. Google's very good about uptime. Let's ping that and see what we get. We get a reply back from 8.8.8.8. .8 .8. Notice the time to live a little bit smaller this time. Instead of 64, we are now hopping through quite a few hops to get to 8.8.8 .8 .8 and back. And you can see statistics at the bottom. We have 0% loss. Now, if something wasn't on the network, if I ping 192.168.0. Let's try uh, 67 and see if 67 is there. I happen to know that 67 is not on my network. And the response we get back is the reply is the destination host, unreachable. Can't find him, can't get there, doesn't exist. I'm not really able to access that device. So depending on your response from a ping, you'll know at that point whether you're even able to communicate out to that device or not. And if you are, you can then continue your troubleshooting. If not, you have some other problems you have to deal with first. It was interesting that we had a different time to live when we went out to Google to see what that device was at 8.8.8.8. It would be interesting to know what were the hops that that went through to get all the way there and back. On the internet, you may be stepping through quite a number of different routers to get to your final destination. And then it has to step through all of those routers to get back to you. And usually, there are quite a few different links along the way. The Traceroute program gives us some insight into that process on just how many routers it has to go through to get there. Let's do a Traceroute to 8.8.8.8 and see what we get. The Traceroute command has a lot of different functions available to it. Let's just use the defaults. Trace route, which is abbreviated in Windows to trace RT. And I'm going to go to 8.8.8.8. And we'll just hit Enter. And what we'll do is start hopping through different links along the way. If we get a response back from these devices, it will tell us 
the, how long it took to get there. If, if at any time it also is at the end of this, you'll notice there's a bit of a delay. Sometimes it goes a little faster as it tries to do a DNS lookup of the router and give you the actual name of the router. If it can't find a name, it waits until it times out and then continues through with the next one. These columns are the response times that we're getting for the trace route, which should give us an idea of just how fast or slow those particular network links are. So to get to 8.8.8.8, we've already hopped through. We're on our 10th hop now. Notice we missed a response there on that uh, response time value. Uh, sometimes that does happen. We lose packets on the network on occasion, and that may have been the case there. We're already on hop 12. We're still working through the network. And you can see, just to get to that one server, we've had to go through 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And finally, on the 13th hop, we were able to get to the Google public DNS. And it was the DNS A at uh, .google.com. That's how far we got along that way. Some of these routers along the way did have a name associated with them in a name service. And it actually put up here exactly on the Comcast.net network. I went everywhere from Tallahassee to Mobile, Alabama to Dallas, Texas. And then finally, somewhere along the line, we weren't able to get any names anymore. And we finally got to Google and back. So that hopped all over the Southeast United States before it ever got back to me. And we were able to see all of that with the trace route command. If you recall, when we did that trace route, at the end of the trace route, it said that we were connecting to google-public-dns-a.google.com. But I had typed in 8.8.8.8. .8 well, this process of finding out the name of a device or to deriving the IP address of a device based on the name is done through something called an NS lookup. And you're able to go to the command line, type in any name you'd like, and it should report back the IP address of that device. Let's see uh, what we can do. Let's try some different names on the internet and see what IP addresses we get back. We can run the NS lookup command right at the command line. And let's do an NS lookup of 8.8.8.8. .8 .8. This is going to be a little bit confusing because it's going to go to a Google public server and it's going to res respond back that it looked up that address and it happens to be the same server that we're using to do these DNS lookups. What if we did an NS lookup of www.google.com? That's a little bit different. We're doing it in reverse. And it's still going out to the Google public DNS server to get this answer. And the answer that it gets back is to get to www.l.google.com, we can go to any one of these IP addresses. You can see Google has a lot of different options for connecting out to that Google server. And so your machine will pick one of these DNS updates. And from that point on, whenever you type in the google.com address, it just knows to always go to that IP address. Let's try another one. Let's uh, NS look up. And let's go to www.cnn.com and see what the IP address is of CNN. CNN, again, has a number of different IP addresses. And there's a list there that we could also choose from. This is really what's happening all the time behind the scenes. You go in a browser and you type yahoo.com. Behind the scenes, the DNS resolver that's built into your operating system goes out to whatever your default DNS server is, like the 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 at Google, and it asks, hey, do you know where Yahoo is? And that server responds back with a list of IP addresses associated with that web page. And at that, at that point, your computer ceases to know what yahoo.com is. It uses that IP address to communicate back and forth. If later in the day you use that again, you type in yahoo.com, has a local cache, and it remembers, oh yes, I've already been there. I've already done the lookup for that. Now let me just go to the IP address instead of the yahoo.com. It's a very, very slick way to do this, very easy. And you can always track back what you're getting based on that name or IP address using the NS lookup utility. On your computer, there are constant network connections being created, being torn down, that are in process. There are a number of network connections that are waiting for people to connect to your machine so that it can provide a list of the available shares on your machine or a printer that might be shared. There's many other things that we could see behind the scenes by using the netstat command, because that's going to list out for us all of the different active connections and that are on our machine, some that are currently established, some that are waiting to be established. But we're able to view all of it with that netstack command. Let's start our netstack command. I'm just going to start type netstat and hit Enter. And what we're looking for is the active connections that may be on our computer. And it's gone through the list of those. And it knows that I just had a web browser up. And there was a connection that was there already. Let's start another web browsing session here. 
And behind the scenes, we're going to let that build and do what it's doing. And what I would expect to see now is another list of active connections that are on my computer and what they happen to be doing. You can see the port numbers in use. And now you can see a couple of others have popped up. We can go to yahoo.com. We can bring up another tab and go to google.com. There we go. And we should see active connections now building based on these websites that we're going to whether we are established to them or whether they're open connections coming back into us. The NetStack command has a lot of command line parameters associated with it. You can really drill down on some very specific information here. For the purposes of our A-plus certification, we just have to know about the command and what it does. But as you can see, there's a wealth of information that you can get out of the NetStack command if you know exactly what you're looking for and trying to troubleshoot whether you're able to make a connection to a device or not. The net command is exclusively for Windows environments. You won't find the net command on a Linux machine or a Mac OS device. This is to provide us with interfacing to many different functions that will allow us to share the, the Microsoft Windows shares, to start services, to look for uh, other devices on the network, other computers on the network, all using the Microsoft protocols. And you can see the net command itself. If we did a net just by itself, look at all the different options you have available. There's account information, computer information, user information. And we can view different things on the network. Let's try it out at a command prompt. Let's see this net command in action. I'm just going to type net and hit Enter. And you'll see that list of all of these different things. If I type um, net user, and we'll see the prompt here. Here's all of the user accounts on my professor PC computer here. There's an administrator account, there's a guest account, and there's the professor account. If I do a net accounts, there we go. You can see information about the account configurations, uh, the minimum password age, the maximum password age. These are all set to defaults because that's what I've configured currently. I haven't changed any of the defaults in here. So all of these are very specific into how your Windows device communicates to other Windows devices using Microsoft's own protocols. And if you look through a number of these, you'll start to see things like the ability to view all of the available shares on a machine, or the ability to see everybody who's connected to your device. And when you're troubleshooting Microsoft problems, that can really come in handy at the command line. If you were to sit down in front of a computer for the first time and you're working on troubleshooting that device, you may want to know the local IP address, the IP address of the router that this device connects to, what DNS server is used by this computer to do its name resolution. You can view all of those things in Windows with the IP config command, and it will list out for you everything associated with the IP configuration of that device. Let's run an IP config on my machine here. And you can see my machine. You can see the IP address associated with it, the subnet mask, the default gateway. I can see I've got other connections on here. I have one adapter. I have another tunnel adapter and another tunnel adapter on here. And those are probably used behind the scenes for VPN and other types of capabilities that I've configured on here. The one that we're using is this local area connection adapter, and you can see exactly the way that it's configured. And well, that one's interesting to us, but maybe we'd like to see more information. I'm going to type ipconfig slash all and hit Enter. And a lot of things are going to flow by. So I'm going to scroll back up to the top here to where I typed this in. Here's where I typed in ipconfig slash all. And it tells you a lot more in this case. It tells you the host name. It tells you information not only about the card that you're using here, but the MAC address of that device. It is using DHCP to automatically get an IP address. We can see the IP address that we've gotten. And we can also see things like the DHCP server we got it from. And we can also see DNS information. So the slash all really shows you everything you would need. And now you can start troubleshooting this from here. Can I ping my DNS servers? Can I ping those DHCP servers and work your troubleshooting process out from there? If you're managing devices remotely on the network, you may find yourself needing to log into those devices at a command line and do some work on those machines. One of the programs you can use to do this is called Telnet, which is also the protocol that's used for this application to work properly. And it allows you in this console mode to connect to an external device so that you can use the keyboard and the command line of that device to perform functions and do the normal administration of that device. One thing to keep in mind is that Telnet 
is an unencrypted communication link. You don't generally see this used on enterprise networks because you don't want to log into routers and switches, which are extremely important infrastructure devices, and not have any way to encrypt the data between you and that device. In those cases, we're doing something called SSH, or Secure Shell. It works exactly the same as Telnet. It looks exactly the same as a Telnet might be. But the link between you and that device is an encrypted communication. Normally, you have to check that remote device and make sure that it can support SSH or that you have the ability to connect to that device via SSH. In enterprise environments, most of the time, they're actually disabling the ability to connect with Telnet because they don't even want an, an opportunity to connect to that device and not have it encrypted. Almost all the devices these days default to SSH. And normally, everybody only turns on the links to be encrypted using that SSH connection. Let's review some of the things from this module on network troubleshooting. Our first question, which troubleshooting tool can determine the path a packet takes through the network? Well, we watched a packet go all the way through the network, 13 hops away to that name server, and it was the traceroute command that allowed us to do that. You can abbreviate that at the command line and use it trace RT as your command. And the next question, which suite of commands provides information about the Windows network? Well, we were already using some of that to view the users that were on my machine, and that was the Microsoft Net command. And the last question, which remote communication protocol provides a secure connection between devices? We had the option of one that was not encrypted and one that was encrypted, and that secure link was SSH, or Secure Shell. That covers our requirements for our 220.702 section 3.1, where we've used a lot of different tools here at the command line to be able to help troubleshoot our network links. If you'd like to watch any of our absolutely free a videos, you'd like to participate in our message boards or much more, you can visit our website at freeaplus.com.